Hi, I'm Matt Needham, and this is my lecture on troubleshooting and operating conditions of air conditioning and refrigeration systems. The thrust of this lecture is to really look at the temperatures and pressures involved um, with air conditioning and refrigeration to see how is the equipment working, uh, what might be wrong with it. And the first step is to really know what you're looking for to know what the proper temperatures are. Take, for instance, high temperature refrigeration, 45 to 60 degrees. And this is like the romance stuff, the wines, the flowers, the chocolates, like truffles, like you might get at Seas Candy. And one time I had a service call where I had to drive up to Santa Barbara from the San Fernando Valley. And the maintenance manager's like, hey, this case is, is too warm, it's 60. And I'm like, we, this is like, you know, expensive little chocolates they're selling. Uh, it's supposed to be served at 58 to 60. Okay, I'll, I checked the system, it was fine. All we had to do was lower the thermostat to 58 to make him happy and, um, you know, so he wasn't aware of what the actual temperature should be and he generated the service call. For me, easy money on a Sunday, huh? Okay, now, um, medium temperature is just above fr freezing, just above frozen. Usually most of the products are more like 33, um, 34 degrees to 40 degrees, like what you would have the temperature in your refrigerator at home, right? Sometimes though it's considered 30 degrees or even in some cases 29 for things like meat in a supermarket. You're saying, well, it's above freezing, what about this? and the 30 degrees. Well, the meat, because there's salts in there, in there, doesn't freeze until you usually get around 28 degrees. So they want to keep the bacteria level low. They want to keep it as bright and fresh as possible. So a lot of times around 29 or 30 for meats, okay, which is still above freezing for that product. And then um, up to 45 degrees is the classification. Um, but generally, the health inspector, if you are serving food that's supposed to meet medium temperature and you get up there 42, 43, they're going to kind of ding you. So usually most of the products we keep in medium temperature are like 33, 34 to 40 degrees. Okay? And this is like all your dairy, your meats, fruit and vegetables, um, a lot of them, although some of them can creep into that high temperature range and, and uh, that can be okay. Um and then we have low temperature refrigeration, and most everything here is like zero to minus 20 degrees, okay? Zero to minus 20 degrees, the classification is below freezing. Um, the only things I can really think of that would be above zero that we wanna keep, um, but still below freezing, would be like when we make ice with a commercial ice maker, they start making ice at 20 degrees, and as the evaporator gets colder and you build more ice, uh, it finishes off usually at five um, degrees. Um, also, if you're going to do ice carving, the optimum temperature, just so you know, is 20 degrees. So you might set up a freezer to do that. And I've thought about doing that actually as a hobby because my dad's hobby was wood carving. And I'm a refrigeration guy, so synergy. Okay. Um, and then the evaporators always have to be colder than the boxes that were cooling. Like if you have a medium temperature box and it's 39 degrees and you're trying to drop it down to 38, 37, the only way that box gets colder is if it has something even colder to give up its heat to, which is your evaporator. And typically the evaporators for all of these high, medium, and low range somewhere between 10 to 20 degrees colder in refrigeration. Okay. For example, if you have a you're keeping wine at 55 degrees. And wine's like a whole religion where people like spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and they, well, the whites are kept here and the reds are a little warmer and all that. Okay. Now, if you're keeping wine at 55 degrees and you're trying to just get it to 54 and have the unit shut off, then the only way it gets colder is if the evaporator would be 35 degrees, right? And generally in the high temperature range, usually the evaporators are like 20 degrees colder, okay? Um, on the other hand, freezers, once you get below zero, it's closer to 10 degrees um, colder, the evaporator, so that if you have a freezer that's running at negative two degrees, that evaporator is probably closer to negative 12 or negative 14 degrees, okay? But it's still in that range. And then 
Also be aware of this though, that none of this really works, the 10 to 20 degrees colder, unless you're kind of right there at near where the box should be operating. And again, like all these things, if you start them up brand new, it might be ambient in there, 70, 75. That's called a hot pull down. Don't expect your evaporator to be only that much colder. You're gonna have higher amps, a bigger temperature difference, probably higher superheat, etc. until you get into that operating range of right where the box should be operating. And then these numbers will appear a lot closer for you, okay? Now in air conditioning, it's usually around, the evaporator is usually around 35 degrees colder than the air entering it, okay? So that if you have air coming in to the evaporator from a building or a room that mixed air and it's um, 75 degrees, okay, uh, the evaporator is probably operating at 40 degrees, okay, 35 degrees colder, right? And so, I mean, if, it's, if, if the unit's been off or broke down and it's 80 degrees in there, then the evaporator would um, be closer to 45 degrees, right? And then in air conditioning with straight cooling, we don't want to ever have ice on the evaporator. So you don't really want to be running your system down below 65 degrees because now at 65 degrees, subtract um, 35 um, degrees and uh, you're at 30 degrees and you're, you're building up a little bit of frost on your coil, okay? Um, so air conditioning, 35 um, degrees colder. Now, because of the all of this, and the temperatures tend to drop way quicker, especially in refrigeration. Box temperatures are going down, you know, right away. And it's, it's, it's a bigger unit for the area it serves. Think about your refrigerator freezer at home. You have this compressor, but how many cubic feet is it? You know, 21 cubic feet or something like that. Where when you think about a house with air conditioning, um, uh, 2,000, uh, square foot home, um, you might have, you know, 18,000 or whatever cubic feet of space, something like that. So, um, in refrigeration, the boxes get cold a lot quicker. Boom, 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 boom. So the temperatures and pressures are changing and it's a little hard to follow. And for actually just checking if your refrigerant charge is close at any point for refrigeration or air conditioning, if you look at the head pressure, more than the low side pressure, it's going to give you a better representation of that, okay? Um, at all times. Also, because the condensers are always operating in the conditions they operate at. The air entering in your kitchen through the, your refrigerator condenser is pretty stable. Um, and outside air temperatures, it would be very rare for the outside air temperature to ever be dropping more than one degree every 15 minutes or rising one degree more than every 15 minutes. And so everything is more stable and easier to look at. Condensers generally operate 20 to 30 degrees warmer than the entering air. I say entering air because it's not always outside air. While we have a lot of refrigeration equipment like your refrigerator at home, it's the air temperature entering your condenser, which is your kitchen air temperature inside your house for refrigeration. And in the restaurants, you have lots of little refrigeration equipment inside the store, so it's the temperature entering it. Now for air conditioning, it's pretty much always outside air temperature in the shade. And if you add 20 to 30 degrees above that temperature, that's about what your head pressure should be at. And so even if you're charging a machine and you once you get up near that point, just stop and then see how it operates. Your charge is going to be close. It'll stay running. And then you can always add little bits of it and be looking at, and, and again, I always say for troubleshooting, don't have tunnel vision. Don't say me add refrigerant till bubbles go away in sight glass. I'll hunt you down if you do that. Uh, and don't just go off the condenser. Look at the whole thing. Look at your how fast the box or the room temperature is dropping. Do we have a good temperature drop for air conditioning across the coil? What is my amperage? Do I feel heat off coming off the condenser? This kind of thing, okay? So let's take an example now for like refrigeration 134A for the air entering a piece of equipment. And I don't care if it's medium temperature or low temperature, it still works 
134A, let's say the air entering the condenser, whether the condenser is outside or inside, doesn't matter. The air temperature entering your condenser is 70. Now, older equipment, this 30 degree temperature was pretty much right on. Um, and a lot of refrigeration equipment and some older equipment, it's still pretty good that 30 degrees. And I'll talk about it in a minute. So if you add the 70 plus the 30, you get 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Now on a, refriger, uh, a refrigerant pressure temperature chart, if you look at 100 degrees and then you go across and you find the pressure for 134A, it'll be 124. Your head pressure should be somewhat near there. It's not exact. And if you're charging a system um, and you want to look at one thing and not be confused by your low side pressure, just kind of pound refrigerant in there till you get to be like whatever, 112 PSIG or something like that. Then stop and watch the operation. You can always add a little bit more until you get here and see how your box is working. If you overcharge it, now you have to recover some refrigerant. That's a pain in the ass. Okay. Or, now let's say this 134A system, the same exact system that we're talking about, it's a very hot day in the summer and the air entering is 100 degrees. You add 30 to that, you get 130, and the good normal head pressure is 199, okay? So by looking at that, it gives you a good sense if the charge is correct and a big aspect of the unit operating right or not. Um, and again, if you have a 410A system, and see I color-coded them accordingly, pink or rose, these are usually more high-efficiency systems, newer systems, and they try to make the condensers physically a lot bigger than they used to be. And they have a higher sear rating, you know, I'm talking like a, a 15 or 16 sear, something like that. It's usually 20 degrees above the temperature of the air entering your condenser, okay? So if it's 70 degrees outside, you might add 20 degrees and get 90, and then you look on a PT chart, and the head pressure should be 274, okay? If that same system is trying to operate and cool on a 100 degree day, you add 20 degrees, you get 120, you're looking for a 417 head pressure. Now don't be like, well, it's 410 or it's 420, and that, no, that's only one thing to look at, okay? This is, these are approximations to get you close on your charge and the system operating. Again, if you're charging, keep adding, I would add refrigerant here until I got to be like 399 or 400, and then I would watch it, and then I can always add a little bit more. Take superheat, take subcooling, take temperature drop across your coil. Generally in air conditioning, not refrigeration, if you're dropping the temperature on average about 20 degrees across your evaporator, that's pretty good. If the relative humidity is high, you'll probably only be able to drop at 18 or 19 degrees. If the relative humidity is low, you may be able to drop that temperature 22, 23 degrees across your evaporator, okay? So even if I'm adding refrigerant and I only get like 15 degrees drop across my evaporator and my head pressure was like a little low, like at 380 or something like that, I'd be like, and then, you know, I might take a superheat subcooling reading, don't have much subcooling. Okay, now I'm going to add a little more refrigerant. And then lo and behold, the head pressure pops up to 415 and the temperature drop across your evaporator is um, 20 degrees and now we're good. Okay, so this is looking at the condenser pressure to kind of get a sense of the operation of all of this equipment. Now, let's look here a little bit at some common problems that you run into. And again, these are non-electrical problems and I'll give you some symptoms and ways to figure this out. And the first group is just, these first four are four very common problems that you run into all the time in the air conditioning or refrigeration industry. So a dirty condenser, and I don't care if it's a big water-cooled condenser with a scaled condenser or a fouled condenser, or just a regular air-cooled condenser with a lot of dirt or lint on it. The number one symptom of a dirty condenser is high head pressure. And you can also generally just look at your condenser and go, oh my God, it's dirty, and then rinse it off, clean it. Sometimes you have to use a condenser coil cleaner along with that to clean your condenser. And this is probably one of, probably the most common problem in the air conditioning refrigeration industry 
this is just my opinion, but um, people are have a lot of programs for changing air filters and things like that. Um, but sometimes coil cleaning can be neglected. And in places like restaurants, coils, those condensers that are in greasy kitchens, they get a layer of grease vapor on them and they get dirty. They can be plugged up in 60 days. Okay. So if somebody drops the ball on cleaning those, it's going to create a problem for you. So we have a lot of issues with that. Dirty condensers, um, high head pressure, again, is your number one symptom of that. Uh, plugged air filter, again, we don't have air filters in refrigeration, only air conditioning, okay? And um, an air filter that is plugged, and a lot of times they're not that plugged. You see, people are, cha we're, cha we're, I promise you, every year in the United States, we waste millions and millions of dollars just in the price of filters because people are changing discolored filters that aren't even half plugged. Okay, a good tip is, although you can do static pressure drop across it, 0.6 and all of this, but if you can't see light through the filter, it's plugged, change it up, okay? Um, or if you're not gonna be back there for a long time and it is pretty dirty, change it, okay? However, a plugged air filter, what it does is it cuts down on the airflow. And actually, if it's like kind of plugged, but not totally plugged, the temperature coming out of your supply register will be lower. If the system is operating fine and the air comes in at 75 and it comes out at 55, and you come back a year later and nobody's changed the filter and the air is coming in at 75, but you have a plugged air filter now, the air is going to come out at 47. But you're not hardly going to have any flow and the air is slowed down, and because it's slowed down, it comes into contact with your evaporator longer, has more time to cool off, okay? In air conditioning, you'll start to see a little bit of frost or ice on your coil. You're going to see a low superheat or no superheat um, on your suction line, okay? So lack of airflow, um, a bigger than normal temperature drop, an iced up coil, these are all symptoms of a uh, plugged air filter, okay? And then low on charge is nowhere near as common as these. That means you really have a leak. Low on refrigerant charge, your number one indication of low on refrigerant charge is abnormally low suction pressure. If you start at the machine and the suction pressure goes all the way down and almost near the low pressure cutout, most likely the problem is low on charge, low on refrigerant charge. Okay, and um, then we have low air airflow across the evaporator. Well, that's kind of like plugged air filter, but I wanted to give this one its own one. But that could be for a lot of reasons. Okay, um, a lot of supply air registers closed. You don't have enough air movement across it. You may be starting to ice up your evaporator. Uh, somebody plugs or puts a suitcase or something in front of a return air grill. Dampers are closed. Um, loose fan belt, if you have something like that, uh, could be, or lack of airflow for any reason, right? And then also with electrical bad capacitors, bad evaporator fan motors, all of that um, can add up to low airflow, all right? Um, another problem while I'm on, it just popped in my head, that can occur that kind of is similar is in air conditioning, people putting the thermostat too low in commercial settings, and this happens generally, you get this service call early on a Monday afternoon. Because they went out, lunch, a lot of margaritas, hot chips, this and that, salsa, and they came back and then the boss isn't there and they think I'm hot and they jam the temperature down, the thermostat down, we make it colder faster to 50, and then they sneak out at 345 and nobody's in the office or the building for that package unit on the roof all weekend and then the air conditioning is like my chance I get to be a refrigeration unit and it tries and somewhere around 63 degrees while it's running incessantly trying to get to 50 it builds a block of ice and lo and behold by Monday afternoon they come in the copiers are on the coffee machines the people the heat and they get too warm and then they have dripping of water because now the ice is so big and thick blocking the coil it's starting to drip water so a temperature, a thermostat set too low, especially in commercial applications in this kind of scenario that I mentioned, 
It uh, doesn't happen much in residential because people are like, dang, I'm cold. Let me shut it off before you get a block of ice on your evaporator. Now, these are ones that are a little bit more rare, but I'm going to give you some tricky little ways to figure them out. A, a poor condenser airflow isn't just a dirty condenser. Sometimes people like don't want to see their air conditioning equipment at their homes and they have condensing units to sit outside and they plant bushes and trees around it. And they do a good job when they do that, but then the bushes and trees get a little overgrown and can plug up your airflow around your condenser. People can just leave objects and the if the condenser air is blowing up and it's hitting something, um, it you won't get good airflow through your condenser. So people just leaving something leaned up against their um, condenser. Also, poor condenser airflow isn't dirty, but when the gang members get on your roof and they tag their gang symbol into your condenser and bend those fins over, poor condenser airflow. Okay, uh, now compressor pumping poorly. This is where you have a compressor that's running and has, and you're like, you know what? It seems like, I'm not sure, is this running okay or not? I, it, it, we're not really getting cooling. I'm, it's running, it's pulling amps. It seems like the pressures are a little off. I'm not sure. Here's how you test it. Now, in the textbook that we use, um, they give you a bunch of different ways. Just do this one way. Just run the compressor, start up the compressor without the condenser fan running, or if it's a small system, take the panel, take some cardboard, and just block your condenser. If that compressor can get the head pressure up, even close to, head, to where the high pressure cutout is, it's pumping good. If it can't, then the valves are leaking and some of that refrigerant is going back into the low side. If the head pressure only goes up a little bit and can't go up anymore, you have a mechanical problem with your compressor and the, the top end would either need to be rebuilt if it's a bigger serviceable type of compressor or most likely just changed. Okay, now here's a problem that isn't very common, but I'll give you a quick check. A plugged liquid line filter dryer. If the system's running and you're struggling to find out what's wrong, you're not getting much cooling, but you're getting some flow. If you put your hand just across the filter dryer and you feel a temperature drop across it, it's plugged, it's the problem, it needs to be replaced because it's trying to turn itself into the metering device. And as it plugs it, a little bit of that liquid is flashing off to vapor and it's getting very it's getting colder here. So if you feel like, oh, it's, it is a colder here than here, quite a bit colder here than here, you actually say that to yourself, this is your problem, okay? A plugged liquid line filter dryer. Now, a metering device restriction, sometimes it, because people didn't do a good job, maybe when they were putting a new liquid line filter dryer and they got copper shavings or dirt in the system, or even sometimes in refrigeration, I've run in this particularly with freezers on the metering device, like the thermostatic expansion valve, um, you can start to have water that freezes on the seat of the expansion valve and um, restricts the flow, okay? So, but, you know, generally I'm talking about like dirt and copper and, and uh, shavings and things like that, plugging your capillary tube, okay? or possibly your thermostatic expansion valve. But how do you find out if you have a plug capillary tube in particular or something stuck on your seat blocking the flow? Okay. So first of all, like it's, if it's a refrigeration box, in particular is probably you're there, it's too warm. I want you to turn on the equipment and just run it for a minute and let the suction pressure go way down low okay, for your air conditioning or refrigeration. And usually it goes down a little lower than it normally does and it comes back up, particularly in air conditioning. And then I want you to shut the power off. And then because the box isn't cold, the pressure should start to equalize at a pretty steady rate. After 10 minutes, if the, if the pressures aren't somewhat close, they don't need to equalize perfectly. If it's not equalizing at a steady rate, you can feel confident that your metering device is restricted. Now, if you're trying to do this with a cold box in refrigeration, you're gonna end up with that pressure temperature relationship if you run it for long enough, um, particularly like if you have two or three evaporators in a big walk-in and you're dealing with one system but the whole box is cold. Uh, and, so, and there are bigger systems that have two or three, but 
for like a little unit or even a capillary tube or metering device, if you shut it off, the pressures, I'm not saying the pressure should equalize. By the way, in air conditioning refrigeration, it would be very rare for the low side and the high side to ever those pressures to be equalized perfectly. That means that the evaporator and the condenser are in the same temperature environment, okay? But it should start to come back. If you run the machine for a minute and that low pressure just stays down there and barely comes up or doesn't come up much over 10 minutes, then you'll say, okay, I have a plugged metering device, okay? Or capillary tube. And that's my final tip, and that concludes our lecture on troubleshooting and operating conditions of air conditioning and refrigeration equipment.